Tokyo Hospital, uh, Univers University Hospital. Uh, she works mostly with the leukemia and myeloma patients. She also cooperates with uh, patients of myeloma, Slovak Myeloma Organization, and the club of uh, club of patients after uh, marrow bone marrow transplantation. And floor is yours, Susanna. So good morning, everyone. Uh, as it was said, my name is Susanna. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I was asked to present the psychological aspect of coping with chronic disease, which I'm really honored to do. Um, and I prepared this presentation. Actually, I put five main messages there, which we will go through, and I will explain why it's important to bring this to uh, cancer patient, myeloma patients, patients coping with chronic disease. And at the end of the day, probably for every one of us, I have to say that uh, I know what I will be speaking about because I'm trying to do the same and it's not easy even if you don't have chronic disease. Uh, many of the things you will know, uh, many of the things you all do as I'm listening these two days, or we all do for us and for our patients, uh, but the thing of this, this presentation is to give it the psychological context to show how important it is to work with, with the soul, with uh, not only with the physical side, but also with the psychical side uh, of the patient. And I would say psychosocial, because the relationships and, and all the social background is uh, at least the same, if not more important during the treatment. Yeah, that works. Uh, so, uh, I was trying to put the myeloma disease into um, into some kind of maybe just to say like this is how it works when you have myeloma and then I found this picture and it was like yeah this is how it works when you have myeloma because sometimes you are up, sometimes you are down, sometimes you feel good, sometimes you're tired, sometimes you can just turn the world around and uh, it's just like a roller coaster and this made me really really happy when i found this this ribbon part there because it's a symbol of myeloma disease and at the same time it shows that when you are diagnosed like at the beginning i should have a pointer here and there we go it's not very visible but at the beginning when you go up up there and then you just put down it's when they tell you you have a disease and everything is upside down and you don't know what to do with your life. After some time, we get to know that my... I can, okay, there we go. That myeloma is not like the end of the world and the life is possible with myeloma, but it takes time to get to this point for the patient. So that's actually the time when you are down and going like, okay, it's up and down, but I'm still alive, I can do my job or I can travel, I can be with my friends, I need to go to bed earlier, but still it's okay. And then the symptoms attacks and it's just like up and down and twisted and everything. So this is really like, as I know my patients or patients that I work with, this would really fit uh, basically how, how the disease is going with them. And yeah, what I forgot to say at the beginning that I'm kind of interactive. <laughs> so I would give you some questions during the presentation and I would like us to, to cooperate. This is the first question. So what is the difference between patients with myeloma and all the other people in the world? So myeloma is a chronic disease for patients. Is it okay when they say something and I will repeat it? Yeah. Okay, so we'll do it like this. First was the chronic side of the disease. It has ups and downs. It's a cancer actually, so that's also like a stamp. You have a cancer. Have a, lot a lot of concerns. For risky people, like the life uh, is risky and they have to be careful. Is it okay? They have, to live with, uh, <coughs> they have to live with disease for the rest of their lives yeah. so far. Many confusions. Many confusions. Mm -hmm. 
So it conquers your body. Okay. So it's a little bit of discrepancy that at the same time you are that kind of active person, but on the other side there is the disease that uh, affects the physical side. This is very nice what you say. Your body is not yours anymore. There is another person and that's the disease which is in your body. Okay. Permanent disabilities. Exactly. So there are actually a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Pain. A lot of pain. Actually, different kinds of pain. Also, people are very tired, or they have these moments when when they are very tired, which doesn't actually let you do the activities. So it's very special to be a myeloma patient. There are a lot of things, and much more, we can say there are much more, that uh, make myeloma patients special, being different from other people. At the same time, you said it, you are the same person, but you are not the same person anymore. So the part of you being the same person, what is what we have in common, or what patients have in common with us, with normal people, I would say, with people who don't have myeloma? What do we all have in common? We all, want to live. we all want to live. The biggest one. We all want quality of life. We want quality of life. We want good life, good quality of life. We want to enjoy the life. That's a good one. We only die one day. All the other days we are going to live. So. Eventually, everybody dies. That's what we have in common. Right. I know a lot of myeloma patients who go to work, just as I go to work, and I don't have myeloma, so there is that activity. So in the first moment, myeloma patients are angry. How about the other people? Do we that, do we get angry? Okay. So we can say. From that moment of anger, when you got diagnosed, you needed to be brave. But I would say we all get angry, but myeloma patients being diagnosed get different kind of anger. That strength that puts you through the disease, actually through the rest of, of your life. Okay. Uh, do we eat? Do you eat as patients? We have, we have families, we have relatives. Very good. Emotions, quite important ones. We have the opportunity to make choices. One of the biggest strengths of all people. We can make choices. Very good. So there is, yeah, something else? Like that. Perhaps there are some questions in life which is not answered. And perhaps you would like to do other things that you couldn't uh, manage that. Myeloma still has a long period. So compared to other diseases, perhaps there are advantages to have the same quality. And I think that is a lesson to be learned. It's not always negative. You have to focus on the positive side always. 
That's very true. It's not only negative. Myeloma patients got a disease which is chronic, so they have a lot of time to uh, go through all the life priorities, let's say the choices, what is important, what, how, I we, uh, how we want to live. Uh, it's not, as you said, when you got a heart attack and die just like that, there is no chance to uh, like undo the mistakes of the life or, or do something better or different. Myeloma patients have this chance and I want to say it's good for this slide because everybody has this chance to do this. Myeloma patients or patients with chronic disease somehow have to, if they are not totally blind to life challenges, they just have to go through, through remaking the priorities in life, whether they want it or not. So there is a lot, a lot of things we have in common, starting from being human to something which is special for myeloma and similar to other people. Um, I'm always thinking at this slide about people who have other disease, which might be chronic or may not be chronic. Uh, I have to say I got through this point in my family, not with cancer, but with other type of disease, which is definitely going to be for the rest of the life. And um, it was interesting to me to see how similar to cancer patients uh, it is, even if you don't have cancer, because it just does this thing, the life is turning upside down. At the beginning, we can realize later that it's okay, that it's, it's upside down and I like it. So we are approaching message number one. And the message is never stop living. It's very simple, because even if there is something in your life that changes, it's still your life. And I have this question in my mind that uh, when you have a child or when you get a new job or where you... I didn't do anything. Okay. <laughs> or when you go travel to a beautiful country that was your dream ever since. Uh, those are beautiful life-changing moments. I've been through some of them, so I can say that even the traveling can be a life-changing moment and uh, they become, those moments become parts of our lives. And then we have the disease and we are like, something bad is happening, I don't want it, and that's where we get stuck. But it's also only an event that happened in our life and the life is going on. And the fact is that, that we only have one life. We don't have seven of them, we are not cats. We only have this one life so even if you have the disease it's not good to stop living it there are moments there is this shock at the beginning the reoccurrence of the disease the treatment when all the day is just laying in the bed and don't talk to me please there are moments i have to say that even staying um, all day in bed even doing nothing is living your life because there are moments when we just have to stop and, and wait for a while so how to live your life, I put it there. Uh, myeloma is a new condition in life, and especially as a chronic disease, it will never disappear. So far, we haven't found a way to make it disappear. So it will, it will be there forever. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it bad. it's bad, but this is how it is. It's staying there. We can change priorities, as we were telling. We can change things. We can change people. I've met a lot of patients who said, I'm not talking to that friend of mine anymore because she was just sucking my energy or something like that. And you know what? I thought I will miss her, but I feel good. So it's just like moving from the comfort zone. Do something else and you'll see that it's okay. Uh, change yourself. Myeloma is already changing you, so give it a space. Maybe it will bring you or bring us or bring your family or anybody to a better place. Let's change yourself, but never, never stop living. This is message number one. Go ahead. That. 
The control is actually like the main topic. What, what you are saying is that when you get myeloma, you feel like you are losing control of your life and you have, like there is nothing you can do about it. Doing changes, it what puts you in control again because you are in control of doing changes. That's what you said. Exactly. That's it. That's the point, that there is something you can do. There are things we cannot influence. We'll get to it later. And there are things we can. So that's... What is m this should be an inspiration for. Do what you can do. Live your life. That's actually what we have to, because otherwise we will be sorry about it at, at the end. So uh, you you lose control and then you get confused somehow about w what's going on. Uh, that's right. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. What to do when we don't know what things are actually under our control or, or who have the potential to be under control. That's what leads us actually to emotion because that's a thing we cannot have under control, but still we can do something about them. I found this picture, which is about six basic emotions that all of us have. The scientists, psychologists found out about it um, because they could uh, found these emotions even in newborns. So all the other emotions we learn throughout our life. But these six emotions we are born with. Can we give them names? What are these emotions on the picture? Okay, so let's go through this. this. This, do you see the green pointer? Okay, so this is happiness, the yellow one. Okay. Sadness. Sadness. Which one? The blue one with the tears. Okay, can be sadness. Red one down here is anger. Okay. Hope. Which is hope? The blue, the this one, and um, this one down here. Hope might be part of part of it, but it's a surprise. It's a surprise, yeah. You can see the baby when you do this, this something like "Where are you? Here are you?" and this stuff, and the baby goes like, "Ah!" Oh, and we think they're happy, but it's actually the surprise, like <laughs> you appeared from behind your hands. So what is left? This one up here. Any ideas? Feeling that you can't talk, it can be, or maybe that you don't want to talk. It's disgust. I have two points for this picture, so we gave them names. Uh, wine, one, <laughs> wine, okay, wine is a good idea, but <laughs> one um, is what is the purpose of these emotions? Just an idea. Why do we have them? Okay, that's very good. So it's a coping of what happens to us for coping. And another thing is, what is the polarity of these emotions? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they positive, negative, comfortable, uncomfortable? You have to have all of them. It's not good or bad. Very good. I love you for this. Because I believe they are not good or bad. They simply are, just like life and disease and that and everything. So maybe we can move to comfortable and uncomfortable, which we like. We didn't get to the green one. So what do you think it is? Frustration. Frustration. In Slovakia, we say we get green from fear. Fear. It's totally the most protective emotion. <laughs> so I would say that we have one emotion that we love to have, and it's the happiness, the joy. We always want to be joy. We have this positive thinking idea, like we have to be happy all the time, which is actually pressure we are not able to stand because, as you see, we have from basic emotions one comfortable, one happiness, and five 
which we don't really like because it's not like it's not comfortable to feel fear to be angry to be to be disgusted like what is this food you know you can imagine a baby when you give it a broccoli or something it's like no so um there is just just to know and i have to say this is the strongest thing i ever told to my patient according to the feedback that came to me that we only have one comfortable emotion all the others are like doing something that we don't really like to our body um here is even written what the emotions are for and as i asked for the purpose you can see that the joy the pleasant one inform us about what is important so when there is something important for us it makes us happy very logical and then we have let's go from down we have the anger when there is a problem when there is something that we don't like anger makes us fighting again that we have fear when there is something dangerous we got scared our body is in this kind of um, um, alarm state and we can actually save our existence through fear we have sadness sadness tells us what we really mean uh, need i mean when i go to shop i'm really really i can it's hard for me to decide what i want to buy so i always ask my, myself a question when i get out of the shop will i be sorry that i didn't get this thing and when i'm sorry then i buy it and when i'm not then i probably don't need it so it works like this disgust it's written very nicely that it rejects what is unhealthy which is really good for patients because we want them to be healthy we want us to be healthy so when there is something i always tell them because you know there are all these restrictions like what to eat and what to not to eat, what not to eat and what to do and what not to do i tell them when you want to do it do it be careful but do it when you don't want to do it when you don't like to eat it for example meat in hospital they have meat two times a day and they don't want to eat meat they want vegetables so i go like don't eat the meat if you don't want it and then there is the surprise which tells us that the situation is new so also something something alarming we see that we need all of them they tell us something every emotion we go through tells us something so the message is it's okay when you feel negative emotions and this is the strongest feedback i got from from patients that they were coming to me like i never heard this and i wanted to hear it that i'm i'm okay when i'm when i'm sad when i cry so, yeah it's okay especially when there is a stressful situation and coping with chronic disease is a very stressful situation with any kind of disease so it's okay negative emotions protect us prepare us for something bad prepare us for something unhealthy something that uh, shouldn't be in our lives and there is the the bottom lines positive emotions may keep us happy but negative emotions keep us alive throughout the evolution that's what kept us alive because it was not about thinking like i can see the i don't know monkeys sitting somewhere and thinking about how are we going to surprise no it was just the intuition and the intuition is built on emotions so they had this kind of stress reaction and they were running away that was fear and that kept them alive we have clothes we don't have hair all around our body and we are not <laughs> living under the trees but we have the emotions to keep us alive so let's feel them this is anxiety the biggest biggest topic or one of the biggest topics uh with our patients i put the picture down there because it took me a long time to figure out for myself as a psychologist and upcoming psychotherapist and 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 all the stuff what the anxiety really is we know it's not really an emotion anxiety itself it's a neurotic reaction of this fight or flight effect for stressful situation it's it's not just an emotion and then i got to an existential explanation as you know existential psychology being of rogers maslow frankel and this kind of people 
and they explain anxiety just like you can see it on the picture. There is the girl being put all together into one small place and there is also the circle under her and um, I would probably say that uh, in Slovak language I call it it's like narrowness when the space around you the life space is really small and you don't have place space to move you don't have where to go and you don't have what to do so that's what anxiety or that's when and where anxiety happens to patients and it happens a lot to our patients especially in hospital and I believe we're not the only country where this still remains because patients are told what to do they are told how to feel you know like patient is crying and the doctor comes and say don't worry don't cry and it's like come on we just said that we have negative emotions and the cry is good to protect us so that our head or heart will not explode so so there is this discrepancy between between how the patient feel and how the patient is supposed to act uh, which even even make the anxiety bigger. I found this beautiful um, chart where there are cognitions about cancer that are still present in our society, in our country, and I believe it's in, in more places, especially uh, going from media and movies where you can see and all these campaigns of um, children having cancer and their sad parents, which it's terrible, I'm not saying it's not, but it's making this picture of cancer being something really, really bad. And we already said cancer is event in life. It's something, maybe I would say it's life changing, but it definitely shouldn't be life taking. And this is um, just like to see uh, when we go with, with these cliche ideas, what it do uh, to patients, which are actually how the anxiety uh, expresses in their lives. I want to point your attention to research we are currently doing, or actually I'm, I'm doing as part of my PhDs. And I was comparing patients with, with multiple myeloma and patients with acute leukemia that I work with. And we found that, yeah, well, there is depression in patients, but the depression that is uh, being demonstrated in cancer patients um, would be like, in most cases, would be demonstrated anyway that there is like some predisposition for having clinical can um, not cancer depression um, but patients only have like some depression symptoms which might be side effects of the treatment or might be just and mostly they are just uh, uh, in in this particular situation of the disease anxiety is another thing there is a high level of anxiety and really significant level of anxiety for patients with both diagnoses but what i was really surprised the higher level of anxiety we found in myeloma patients significantly more than in uh, leukemia patients and there is the questions like why is it like that i was asking <laughs> Myself, I was asking other researches, researches, oh, whatever, uh, well, which I was searching for. So we found it might be the an anticipatory fear of the future. I have this friend of mine, and she's always saying, like, I only have half a year to plan anything, where to go, what to do, because in six months I have my next checkup. And I know her for like four or five years. And she's still in that smoldering myeloma state. So she's doing pretty well. She has this moment being very tired and then being being overactive. She's taking, I think once a month, she's taking some kind of infusion, Im immunotherapy or something like that. And she's doing really well, but it shows that she might say it in a discussion, just like, ha, 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 I only have half a year and then I can plan something else, but come on. It's not like uh, when you when you say something is a humor, it must be funny. But when you take the sentence, I only have half a year to plan, it's not funny. So we can see the anxiety behind here. And we can see that it's mostly an irony being inside her that she has to cope with, uh, with the anxiety, living life where any day something can break out. Like, 
she says, I want the hospital to be nice because any day I can go there to take chemo or to undergo the transplantation or something. So uh, th- this shows that probably, probably the chronic side of the disease is really significant uh, factor when it comes to anxiety. I also was allowed this picture because it's like it's showing one thing that in the anxiety circle you are pretty much close from other world and at the same time it shows that there is space in the circle. So maybe we cannot do everything but there is still something we can do. This is the message. Uh, the message is learn to live in uncertainty. I will tell you a short story about this. I was going, uh, undergoing a training of uh, bereavement, of working uh, with uh, families who lost um, some of, of their members. And this was my teacher. His name is Ruben Bild. He's, I think, from Spain or, an- or Argentina. I'm not sure. He was around 80. And... He was a psychoanalyst analyzed by Anna Freud. So he was really a celebrity for me because somehow I got to personally know Sigmund Freud through this person. And this is the last sentence he told us or told after I asked a question. How come he's able to work with dying people and their families for all his life? He, he was 80 or like slightly bill, um, less than 80. And this is what he told me, and I'm keeping it everywhere with me. There is nothing safe in life. Nothing is certain. Everything. Actually, that is the only certain thing we all have. That's what my grandfather told me. <laughs> so He said, past doesn't exist. It's gone. We can change it. Future doesn't exist. And it's uncertain. We can plan, but it's like, come on. We can plan whatever we want. It's, it, it doesn't have to happen. We only have today, and maybe not even today, but we have this moment, because there can be a plane falling on us in a few minutes, and there will be no dinner, which I would be really sorry, because I want to see Brussels. Uh, if you accept this, if you accept the uncertainty of the whole life, you can accept anything, because you are actually able to live for this moment, and then you can even accept your death and that means that you are free to live when you are not afraid of that moment. Because we always say that things like, I will do it later, or after I finish my PhDs, I will lose some weight. That's my favorite sentence. (laughs) But come on, I wanted to lose my weight when I was finishing high school, then when I was finishing university, and I mean, now there's PhDs, and then there will be the psychotherapy training, and then I will have kids, so there's not any meaning in losing weight, so... Just do it now or, or then say, don't say you're going to do it. So learn to live in uncertainties, message number three. This is what I heard here before, decision making, and I said we are going to come there later. Uh, I made this scheme or this picture of uh, things happening in our lives, which uh, might be problem or doesn't have to be a problem but it's just like with having a kid it's not a problem it's a happiness but there are a lot of stressful things happening around it Uh, what I want to say to decision making we always think that we have this control over decisions and that we make it because it's good this way or that way as a psychologist I have to say that many times this is just our protection And most of all, we make decisions for people to accept us, for people to like us. We don't know about this because it's happening subconsciously or unconsciously. But it's like evolutionary. We don't want to be alone. We don't want to be like put out of the group. So usually we just go with the group and then we are not really happy about the decision. Chronic disease, myeloma, cancer, whatever we give to this, it's quite really nice. It's chronic, it's cancer, it's myeloma, so it's, it's a lot of, lot of issues at the same time. Puts us to the, to the point that you already mentioned, that you are just, you have to decide. You are put in a position where you need to move somewhere. When you realize how, how, how fragile love, love, uh, love to life is, and that we want to do something with it. So what I'm always showing is that when there is anything happening in life, we have 
these um, possibilities. We can accept the challenge or we can accept any decision that is being given to us. Mummies are this kind of person who always tell, tell, tells you dress like this or uh, keep your house tidy or that is not a good boy for you. These are the sentences we hear. Uh, we can accept that. Like, yeah, okay, I don't like him or I want to dress this way. Um, we can decline them. That's something we don't do unless other people do it. So we can say, I don't want to do it. Or, mom, sorry, I'm going to dress the way I want. I mean, I'm over 30. I can pick my clothes on my own. And sometimes it's not that easy because let's say it's not mother, but it's life. And it's not telling you what to wear, but it's giving you a disease to your life. You don't want to accept it. I mean, who wants disease? I'm not going like, hey, can I have one myeloma, please? No, we just don't want diseases in our lives. But we cannot say no. We cannot say no, thank you, I'm not going with myeloma. I'm not going with broken leg. I don't want to lose somebody from my family. It happens. We cannot say no. And we cannot accept it. So, what do we do? Um, we can choose our perspective. That's what we always have control of. We can choose what we do. We can choose what we think. And even when we are lying, I don't know, there is this extreme uh, example coming to my mind. It was my Loma patient lying in a bed for his last days. And it was before Christmas, and we had all this talking about what he wants to do before he dies, about how he wants his funeral to look like, um, what about talking to family, what to tell, what not to tell, how, like, we went through a lot of things. This was done, and we knew it will probably happen before Christmas, and then he was like, okay, I want to tell you how I'm going to do my Christmas tree this year. That was his choice. He just didn't want to lay down and wait for a black and empty space somewhere, which is <laughs> literally deadly scary. He just wanted to think about nice Christmas. Nice Christmas. That was his his choice. So, whether we want it or not, we believe it or not, we like it or not, we make decisions for people to like us, but we don't have to do it. We can make our own decision choose our own perspective, it makes us vulnerable. But that's what we have psychologists, social workers, patients, other patients, patient organizations for, who can stand by our side and say, okay, maybe your mother is telling you, if you don't do this, you are not my daughter anymore. But then there is this psychologist saying you, you know what, you may be not her daughter anymore, but you will stay my patient. You can decide whatever you want. We give them the feeling they are not alone anymore. We give them the freedom with this to make their own decisions. This is, I have to say, I hate positive thinking. I hate the concept of positive thinking as it's being presented. I already told you why, because there are those emotions. Um, I believe the most important thing is to accept reality, which may not be always positive. And we know how hard it is when you want to cry because there is a shock in your life being put upside down. And uh, there's also something like we don't want to fight. It's just like that and it's better to proceed through that and be happy afterwards. So I'm always offering constructive thinking instead of positive thinking as a concept, which includes the points that you see on the previous slides. It means making your own decision, choosing your own perspective, making a plan. Okay, I said it's like don't make plans because they may not happen. But you can make some ideas that are actually going to happen one day or that, that like what you want to do and go closer to whatever that is. For example, plan the Christmas. I want to be at Christmas with my family. I know I will probably die, but in case not, I want to plan it anyway. And I think the most important thing is consistency. Um, it's the hardest thing, as I said at the beginning, I'm trying to follow these messages myself. And I know how hard it is, even if I, I don't have any chronic disease. Um, when I say I'll go for a walk, for one hour walk, 
three times a week. Believe it or not, I'm not able to do that so far. I'm still saying I'll do the PhDs. My uh, deadline is May 2nd. And then I'll start go for a walk every second day. So it just follow what you plan because you're doing it for yourself. And that's the thing you can do instead of what you cannot do. Yeah, message four. It's another story. Uh, I have to be short, I know. It's another story from my life when I was in quite a difficult situation and I got to mental training. And after the training, my mentor uh, told me <coughs> that uh, what is written there, it's not easy what you have to do. You don't know what you wait, what's waiting for you there. And I know you liked it here, but you know you have to move on. You have all the information you need and you know what you have to do. Just stop analyzing, stop thinking about that, stop considering what ifs, just do it. So anything we plan, let's do it. And then we can become from the small fish in the small glass being really anxious when there is no space. The fish in a big glass, it's shown here alone, but still it's her space and she can move and she can call friends to come to visit. So this is message number four, just do it. My favorite topic, I have to say, quality of life. Uh, there is the definition from WHO. And I also want to say, the, what I want to say about this, just consider what we all have in quality of life. It's not a psychological topic. It's like topic of everything. We have material well-being, physical, emotional, activities, social well-being, and all the things going from there. So we can really see that in quality of life, there are hundreds, hundreds and millions of things we can do for, for patients and to improve their and our lives. So I chose these pictures. Um, it's coral reef. During the day, it's on the left side from your view. I would point it at it. Maybe I will not. This is the night picture, the colorful. And this is the day picture, kind of blue all the time. And what I want to say, when you go diving at night and you have the light and you know there is all the ocean around you will, with all the threads that are there, and you point the light in one place and there is this beautiful, colorful everything. But when you only look like everywhere, when you have want to have everything under control, it's just like a sea. But when you point at one thing, which you can do, and you do it right, and you do it properly, then it's a beautiful thing. Because life is offering one, offering us a lot of challenges, a lot of options. And it's not possible to do everything. It's not. So focus on what you can do instead of what you cannot do. Look at this beautiful, beautiful reef. These are the messages all together. And I'm thinking about what is, what, is, what is next. I have one more slide that I really want to present you. And it's why to do all this with patients. Why to bring psychological issues, why to talk about them, why to br bring social issues, why to talk about them, what, why to do more than just physical care. Uh, as we are doing the, the research, we realized that this is probably how it works. I mean, not only us, I've read a lot of studies about this. Uh, my favorite topic is quality of life and sense of mastery. That's why they are here. And you can see the red line, which is like the cutoff line. What is below it, it's like really low. And what it's about, it's like sig significantly high. So that's basically when we don't give the psychosocial care how it looks like. And you can see that what we really want to do is give the competence to our patients, which means make the sense of mastery higher and lower the anxiety, which means making their own space bigger. So sense of mastery is the feeling of patients that uh, uh, they can control events in their own life. 
basically what is happening they they have under control we know there are a lot of things they cannot control everyone has those things we cannot control and then we have to point just like in the reef we can we have to point the attention to things we can do we have the competence to do and Um, uh, on the other slide, I will talk to it. There is there are three points that I think are important. What to do when we are a patient organization or advocate or where we want to have them, and those three points are communication, uh, appreciation, and reality. And then there is one more, one more thing on the side. Just tell me when I can move it. Okay. So uh, that's the humility, which is probably the most important for everything we do in the life. Because I have a lot of experiences of people who are standing in front of patients telling exactly those things. I know how you feel. And I'm just like, I never told this to my patient. I don't know how you feel. I can try to imagine, but I don't know how it really feels. So tell me. That's why on this other slide, to communication, first of all is listening. We have to listen, we have to ask, otherwise we are trying to fulfill needs of our patients, but we are not meeting them because we are not asking for what they really need. We do a lot of uh, questionnaires, just basing, putting questions and patient, patients are doing answers and we are talking to them or I'm trying to talk them a lot. You can see there is just like information leaflet. And this is one patient of ours. And we are always telling patient stories to, to other patients. We write it on the internet. We do it on our personal meetings uh, so that they can see that, yes, you can go through hard things and then you can go through pleasant things, just like the roller coaster goes. Uh, actually, you can see down there the slide that I was presenting to patients. And um, one of the most important things, uh, accepting limitations. Uh, we know that there are some patients who say, uh, like, uh, okay, tell me everything. And they want to know all the names of the drugs. They want to know all the names of people, of doctors, of, of nurses. They want to know how much of drugs they get, when exactly, uh, how is it uh, being... Um, you know, how uh, the way of how, uh, how they get the drug. So uh, they, they, they want to know everything. And then there are patients who said like, okay, give me what I need to know. I don't want to know more. I will ask when I need. We need to accept that. So just as I was talking to someone yesterday, we need more brochures, leaflets more presentations, more meetings, because we need to meet the needs of the patients, accept their limits. We also have this uh, part where, uh, as a reality, we are bringing to our patients the, now only the names, not the pictures, of patients who diseased, so deceased, so just to show that, well, this is happening and we always have a, a candle or something to, to remember them. And this is just to appreciation, because we are doing everything I'm talking about today. You are doing it every day you work with patients. It's not something, something new. It's just to point out that anything we do, anything we bring to patients, is, is the very important thing of, of showing them how to live, how not to stop living. We take them for walks. It's the first picture up there. This one. We had this myeloma day when we had trainers showing them what exact uh, exercises patients can do to, to make their body work as good as possible. We had actually, maybe you know, this one here is Matej Todd. He's the Olympic winner in walking. And he was the face of our myeloma day to, because walking is something patients can do. I mean, running or, or like this might be dangerous, but walking is something they can do. He actually came between us and we had like an hour discussion with him and the patients were, were asking all the questions. So it was very nice. We, we had this beneficial concert with really like famous artists in Slovakia. And this is our new project when we are doing um, like creative 
activities with patients who want. And there are much more activities. I just didn't want to make this a presentation of our society. I just wanted to show that uh, anything we do, when the patients have a choice whether they can or they cannot or want or will not um, take part in this, we do it to show them that the life is worthy and that still there is a chance to live and to be happy about it, to have good quality of life. It's just everything we were talking about, we do it in this way. I just wanted to give you the view that there is a lot of psychological stuff behind that we are providing to our patients through these basic activities. And I also do it for them because um, I'm doing these kind of presentations for them, explaining how they feel and why they feel so and what they can do about that. So thank you for your attention. So I will be here. Perfect. So yes, I yeah, think it's it's thank you. Sure, no problem for me. Okay, so no problem. And you got a little gift from MP for your oh. great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.